There's a serious problem with not knowing you've been propagandized. It's a bit like missing a train when you had no idea you needed to be on that train. You thought your train was coming soon, but actually it was the one on the other tracks that just left. A good chunk of the crypto space is going to find itself in those shoes. They thought Terra would take them to the moon. They thought Solana could fix its massive downtime problems. They thought ETH 2.0 would fix the ridiculous fee problems. They thought Bitcoin could make at least some technical progress. But most of all, they didn't realize they were consuming enormous amounts of propaganda about proof of stake, Gen 3, and especially about Cardano. This is an unforgiving game, and unfortunately, they're going to miss the train. Ready? Today, we're going to discuss a recent and very revealing Joe Lubin interview, but not so much for what he said. A new innovation from MuesliSwap, Solana having another very bad day, a new Ada Bridge, a World Mobile AMA, a Cornucopia's Mint, and Shahaf Bar Geffen talking Jed soon. If you are constantly late and you justify it to your friends in terms of Zen-based attachment, or if you're finding value in these videos each weekday, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies stake pool ticker AOS. This is a Bloomberg interview with Joe Lubin of Consensus, who is a very prominent figure in the Ethereum ecosystem. In this interview, they looked at this quote from Eric Adams, mayor of New York City, where he basically expressed his excitement about the possibility of putting things like deeds to real estate and birth certificates, important records on the blockchain. Nothing too revolutionary about this so far. You think this is a very promising setup for positive coverage about the potential to store important records on the blockchain. And we've seen some number of, of uh, interviews and articles and things like this in the past. They come out and it's great because this is a great use case for blockchains. And occasionally mainstream media picks up on this and runs a positive article about this very good use case for blockchains. No, no, no. That's not what this is. Right out of the gate, or at least in this clip, right, as, right after they show us that quote from the mayor of New York City about his excitement to do, do exactly this on blockchains, the interviewer says, and I'm going to paraphrase, that's all great if we're talking about immutable proof of work blockchains, but I don't want to put the deed to my house or my daughter's birth certificate on a proof of stake blockchain. They just don't have the security. So I think this betrays the best case scenario, willful ignorance, but probably more likely intellectual dishonesty of the party line here. First, we've got this false dichotomy. He tries to set up two categories of blockchains, immutable proof of work blockchains and proof of stake blockchains. And it's sort of like, I'll let you unravel what proof of stake blockchains are, but they're certainly not immutable proof of work blockchains. This is a false dichotomy, especially in the context of this interview. This is Joe Lubin of Consensus, very prominent figure in Ethereum. And in it, Ethereum's history itself shows the falsehood of, of this distinction because it was Ethereum 1.0, the proof of work version of Ethereum that had its immutability destroyed very early in the history of Ethereum with the DAO hack. They rolled back the chain after the DAO hack, crushing the immutability of Ethereum and kind of altering the trajectory of crypto forever because the immutability of blockchains was something we talked about as a given back then. It was something we expected from big blockchain projects. It wasn't an optional thing that's nice to talk about, but we don't actually observe in practice. It was an important thing. And when they rolled back the blockchain after the DAO hack, they broke the immutability of Ethereum 1.0. That was the proof of work Ethereum that we still have. Ethereum 2.0, this hasn't happened. So we've already seen that you can't, you can't just say that proof of work blockchains are immutable. They can be, or they cannot be, which in fact is the case with Ethereum. 
Then he goes ahead and says, I don't want to put these important records on a proof of stake blockchain. They just don't have the security. This, I think, is at best willful ignorance, but probably more likely intellectual dishonesty. So if we assume it's willful ignorance, and I guess it's possible it could be, I think the the hole in the party line thinking here is that there's some kind of there's some kind of wide overarching heightened legitimacy with proof of work validation which is not actually the case proof of work the distinction between proof of work and proof of stake largely conceptually extends to the selection of the block validator in proof of work, we have this solving of a puzzle that we've discussed many times on this channel. We've talked about exactly how it works in proof of work. This solving of the puzzle is to decide who gets to validate the block. In proof of stake, we have other schemes, including Ouroboros and Cardano, that is also to decide who gets to validate the block. After we make that selection of the block validator for each block, they just go ahead and validate the block. The distinction is just about who validates the block, but it's become this mantra in mainstream media coverage of, of crypto. I wouldn't say mainstream media coverage of crypto. I will say mainstream media outlets who cover crypto a little bit more deeply, not real crypto coverage, but just mainstream coverage that tries to go a little bit deeper. It's become this mantra that proof of work is more secure. And certainly we can sit here and dream up proof of stake systems that are less secure. We can also dream up proof of work systems that are less secure. But we can't say as a general expectation that proof of work is more secure than proof of stake. Joe Lubin, to his credit here, does immediately rebuke the interviewer and says, that's simply not the case. Proof of stake is likely to be far more secure. And he explains, hey, with proof of work systems, you can go out and rent enough hash power to attack a proof of work system with a 51% attack. In a proof of stake system, as you try to acquire 51% of the stake or whatever is the amount of stake you think you need to acquire to attack the network, it's going to become more and more expensive. Anyone who has tried to acquire a, a, uh, a low liquidity coin, maybe a small coin within any ecosystem, including the Cardano ecosystem, has, has seen how fast the price can climb as you try to acquire any kind of a substantial stake in that coin, the price rises extremely rapidly. And Joe Lubin points this out, and the interviewer immediately, you know, sort of dismisses that. And he's like, no, 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 you know, the, the, the party line here is the proof of stake is less secure. And, you know, granted, I'm sure, you know, I'm, I'm sure this interviewer is just like a lot of mainstream media these days. He knows that creating controversy also creates attention. I'm sure that's part of his strategy here. But Lubin kind of discredits this entire line of thinking and the interviewer just sort of just sort of continues on, just sort of continues on as if, you know, uh, logic and making a good argument don't really matter here. What matters is sticking to the party line, and that's that proof of work is more secure than proof of stake. But it's interesting. They don't even get to the level of talking about what happens, what happens after after you try you make your attempted attack. Joe Lubin does say, "Hey, you can rent the hardware, uh, try to execute on your attack, and if it doesn't work, no big deal." But they don't even get into the details of this. When I think about it, what I think about is the fact that you can rent rent the hash power to attempt your attack on a proof of work system, and then after you're done, you know, allow your your leasing of this hash power to just sort of expire, no big deal. If you, let's say you attempt to attack a proof of stake network. Let's say you acquire, let's say you're the richest man on earth and you somehow acquire this gigantic stake in Ethereum 2.0. Let's say you, you're the richest guy and your only goal 
you're an evil genius. Your only goal is to destroy Ethereum 2.0 as the, you know, the interviewer, you know, impliedly would imagine here. And let's say you're willing to bear, bear the costs of that, you know, rapidly rising price as you keep acquiring more and more Ethereum in the Ethereum 2.0 era. Once you've acquired that stake, why would you destroy the network? You own, if you have 51% of the network, you own most of the network. If you attack the network, you're destroying the value that is mostly owned by you. No one would ever do that. If they executed the attack, they would mainly be attacking themselves, which is not the case in a proof of work attack. In a proof of work attack, you could take that hash power, destroy that network, take that hash power and point it at a different network for normal non-adversarial mining and you haven't lost the value of that hash power in a proof of stake attack like they're discussing if you execute on the attack you're mainly attacking yourself it doesn't make any sense to put it another way in this proof of stake attack you couldn't repurpose your stake for anything else if you executed on the attack, you couldn't then take your ETH and, and once you destroy the ETH 2.0 network through your attack, you couldn't then take your ETH and use it to validate on Cardano or validate on any other chain. It's Ethereum. It's Ether. You can't repurpose it to then non-adversarially participate in another chain. In a proof of work, attack you can you could take that hash power and repurpose it for mining on another blockchain so in that sense this isn't a point that joe lubin made he didn't make this point but he has a good point in that maybe proof of stake is more secure than proof of work you can't even make the argument anymore that the hardware behind the hash power is all asics that are specifically designed for that network and so couldn't be repurposed for another network because all of the big blockchains that are proof of work have forks at this point that you could readily aim those same ASICs at. But I think the interesting thing here is the reaction of a lot of the rest of the crypto space to interviews like this. Here we have Tour de Meester, a very serious crypto insider, says, once Ethereum 2.0 suffers a large scale attack, I expect this video will be played on repeat again if we try to be nice here and assume there's no malicious intent to mislead people, that this isn't just a giant coordinated psyops campaign, a decentralized, but coordinated in a decentralized manner, psyops campaign to create propaganda against all of these things, proof of stake and Gen 3 and Cardano especially, then if that's the case, if we're not assuming that kind of malicious intent and propaganda and misinformation, then we have to assume they're just late in understanding. They never got past that stage where they, they were so enamored with proof of work that they could actually understand what proof of stake is. I, I kind of think that is the case with a lot of the proof of work maximalists. I think they have a vague notion of what proof of stake is. They understand that the, the validation power of the network is related to holdings of the assets of the network, but I don't think they've really thought through what these attacks would actually look like and what would happen immediately after the attack. But hey, if they're too late in understanding to actually get on the train, that's on them. Meanwhile, Cardano is over here bringing the innovation heat. Here, MuesliSwap, the first DEX on Cardano tells us, why should we be excited about combining automated market makers and liquidity pools with our partial order book? Question mark. So you understand what's going on here. They're talking about combining a partial order book with the standard AMM liquidity pool style DEXs everybody's used to from the EVM world. This is some new stuff we haven't seen yet. They say, consider this transaction. They're going to take you through an example transaction where they point out that the slippage, 
the uh, price impact of this hypothetical order, which is a little bit too large for the liquidity pool, which is something that does happen. I think we've we've seen this happen a lot in the Cardano ecosystem, how the slippage would make the the trade, basically the swap unworkable. They say we can do better. Now match mat, now partial matching comes into play. They would compute an optimal point for a trade at a certain volume. They can do the trade at the desired price without the slippage. Meanwhile, the pool ratio will move and the user has already received part of their order. Next time the pool ratio moves back below the the desired price, another partial match fills the order a bit more. Orders get filled and pools are stabilized by orders on both sides. They say, of course, this is not hy hypothetical. We have built such a transaction on testnet for you to admire. The only question that remains open, got milk question mark. Looking forward to LP liquidity pool enhanced order books on Muesli Swap V2 soon. Trademark. I love Muesli Swap. They are so understated. They're like, hey, we're bringing you this brand new thing, but we're going to tell you so subtly that most of you won't even understand that we're talking about this brand new thing. <laughs> and then they just kind of roll it out. And everybody's like, wait a second. Does is Muesli Swap now combining the concept of an AMM and an order book in an EUTXO architecture? And it takes everybody like a couple of weeks to figure out like, Oh yeah, that's totally what they did, and it's already up and running on their decks. In the continuing saga of what will Solana's office hours be today, you should be aware there are reports that Solana once again had a very bad day. This is the thread. This is a thread from Evan Van Ness where he says Solana is down again, making the joke, spelling it S Q L Lana. It's a day of the week that ends in Y. After all, he says. <laughs> down here, he explains. Amusingly, Solana doesn't even count this Sol server degraded performance's downtime. This is just an afternoon of your transactions not going through over four hours now, not downtime. Subsequent post, he says, about 6.5 hours of downtime now. Later on, he says, only eight hours of server downtime. And then he mentions that occasionally Web2 developers get mad at him for comparing Solana to SQL and spelling it SQL Lana. Also be aware, Cardano now has another bridge. This one is with Matic. It is brought to us by Meld and it is called Akamon. Akamon, Akamon, Akamon. I don't know how to pronounce it, but they do have this really cool graphic and it's now on Testnet Live. World Mobile is holding an AMA on Thursday, the 19th of May at 8 p.m. UTC. I love these, and I will probably see you there. See that? Reminder set. Pornucopias is going to be doing the test mint leading up to their land mint very, very soon. As promised, it will be on Friday at 2.30 p.m. UTC. This will be the mint of these NFT to tree, the NFT to tree mint of NFT trees. If I remember the details correctly, yep, they have partnered with Veritree. So if I'm remembering correctly, when you buy one of these NFTs, and they're they're going to be cheap, you can find the details in the Discord, but the trees are going to be pr fairly inexpensive. And when you buy one of these NFT trees, Veritree apparently will plant a tree in real life, which I think is definitely a good thing. I think you will agree with me that there's some pressure out there. After all the discussion, there's some pressure out there for somebody, the designers of Jed or Cody, Cody, someone to explain to us how we're not going to get Do Quand. We're not going to get Stable Quand. We're not going to get Terra Luna by this thing, by Jed. So it looks like we are going to get something out of Coty. Jed's stablecoin account says, the CEO of Coty will be on Cardano 360 this week to discuss the robust design of our over-collateralized algorithmic stablecoin. Jed, I think Shahaf Bargeffin is a very good communicator. I think he's very good at exactly this kind of stuff. Will he say anything that could possibly convince me to become a Shen holder? Probably not. I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, pretty unlikely. 
anything is going to be said that will convince me to become a Shen holder, but to each their own. I hope you're having a great week and I will talk to you tomorrow.